So a pleasant day, dear doctors, and welcome to this final coaching for biochemistry. So we're going to go over the must-know pearls about genetics. So let's go over some core principles, some must-knows, as we simplify a very difficult uh, aspect of biochemistry, which is genetics. So let's begin with the concept of nucleic acids, wherein we have two types of nucleic acids. We have the DNA, then we have the RNA. Now, please don't forget the DNA stands for deoxy ribonucleic acids, while RNA stands for ribonucleic acids. I'm going to begin my first question with what is the biochemical pathway which provides the ribose phosphate, which is utilized for DNA as well as RNA synthesis? What is the biochemical pathway that would provide the necessary ribose phosphate? So it is the pentose phosphate pathway, which is also known as the hexose monophosphate shunt. Okay, so this is the pathway that provides the ribose phosphate backbone, which is utilized for DNA and RNA synthesis. Now, some important properties which differentiates DNA from RNA, and this is most likely what's going to be asked in the exam. So first, in DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. In RNA, it is ribose. Now we have what we call the pyrimidine bases, okay, which I will discuss deeper in the next succeeding slides. But in the concept of differentiating DNA and RNA, I want everyone to remember that the pyrimidines of DNA is cytosine and thymine, while in RNA, it's cytosine and uracil. Now, this is what everyone has to memorize by heart, and that is uracil is only found in RNA, okay? So uracil is only found in RNA. Now, another major difference between DNA and RNA is that DNA is double-stranded, while RNA is single-stranded. Now, under the nitrogenous basis, we have pyrimidines and we have the purines. Now the purines, we have adenine and guanine, while the pyrimidines, we have cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Now, again, where do we encounter uracil? Is it DNA or is it RNA? Where do we encounter uracil? Uracil is only encountered in R and A. Now, this is the famous mnemonics. It's famous that basically every student studying biochemistry probably knows this. And this is the pure, okay, standing for purines as gold. So that is P A G. Purines is A, adenine, G, guanine. And I have another personal mnemonics under the pyrimidines. So I want you to pronounce it as pyrimidine, not pyrimidine, because if you pronounce it like pi, you actually cut the pi. So cut is C, cytosine, U is uracil, and T is thymine, with special emphasis on uracil which is only found in RNA. So what are your mnemonics here? What are the purines? Pure as gold. And pyrimidines is cut the pie. Okay. Now, don't forget the mnemonics. Cut the pie and pure as gold with special emphasis on uracil. 
Okay, now, this is how DNA looks like. DNA is double-stranded. So you have one strand here and another strand here, while RNA is single-stranded. These are the bases. This, these are your purine bases. That's adenine and guanine. And these are the pyrimidine bases of DNA, cytosine and thymine. In the single-stranded RNA, the purines is still the same, adenine and guanine. However, in the pyrimidines, thymine is now replaced by uracil. Let me repeat, in single-stranded RNA, thymine is now replaced by uracil. Okay, now there is this famous hypothesis or rule that we call Chargaff's rule. Please memorize this. Now, Chargaff's rule states that the DNA from any cell of all organisms, okay, all organisms should have a special ratio of one is to one. What is this ratio? A ratio if one is to one, pyrimidine and purine basis. So that means the number of pyrimidine should be equal to the number of purines with the ratio of one is to one. And this will be translated uh, according to basis that guanine would be equal to cytosine and the amount of adenine is equal to thymine. So G equals C, A equals T. So please memorize this. Again, what is that hypothesis that states that in all cells, okay, in the DNA of all cells of an organism, the ratio is one is to one of pyrimidines equal to purines such that the base pair should be A equals T and G equals C. What do we call this again? This is known as char caps rule. Now, your reading assignment after knowing char caps rule is to read on what Anfinsen's dogma is. Okay, read on what Anfinsen's dogma and read on what the central dogma is. Okay, two dogmas, and Finzen and the central dogma. So please take note of this. Now, Look at the base pairs, A equals T, G equals C. Now back to basics. What is a nucleotide? A nucleotide is comprised of a base plus a sugar plus a phosphate. That is a nucleotide, okay? For me, tide begins with the letter T, which means there's three three components, a base, a sugar, and a phosphate, okay? Now, if we try to make a diagram here, the schematic diagram will tell you the nucleotide has three components, an inorganic phosphate, a simple sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Now, this is more or less what you have to remember. A nucleoside, side, letter S, is the sugar. It's a sugar and a base. So that's adenine, adenosine, guanine, the nucleoside is guanosine, cytosine, the nucleoside is cytidine, uracil, 
the nucleoside is uridine. Now, please remember, what do we call it when there's a base plus a sugar plus a phosphate? Again, what do we call that? Okay, very good. We now call this a nucleotide. Okay, so I'm glad you're with me. Now here, a very busy slide, but this is a very predictable thing during exams. So number one, I want you guys to take note of ribose 5-phosphate. Now, do you remember where this ribose 5-phosphate came from? Again, from what pathway did the ribose 5-phosphate come from? Okay, it came from the pentose phosphate pathway or the hexose monophosphate shunt. Now, ribose 5-phosphate will be converted to 5-PPRP. So let me just put the abbreviation here, 5-PP, okay, or PRPP rather, 5-PRPP. That's 5-phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. It is the 5-PRPP that is converted to IMP, IMP, or inosine monophosphate. Now, fast forward. Inosine monophosphate will be converted to hyposanthine. Now, this is very important. Okay. Now, IMP can be converted to GMP and GMP to guanine. AMP or adenosine monophosphate to adenosine and adenosine will become inosine. Therefore, the common product here is really the hyposanthine. Okay. Now, hyposanthine will be converted to xanthine. The enzyme here, okay, memorize this by heart, is xanthine oxidase. Xanthine will be converted to uric acid, and the enzyme is xanthine oxidase. Now, question, what is the rate-limiting enzyme in purine metabolism in humans? What is the rate-limiting enzyme in purine metabolism? So the rate-limiting enzyme is going to be xanthine oxidase. Okay, the rate-limiting enzyme is going to be xanthine oxidase. Now, there is another enzyme in uric acid metabolism that I want you to know, and that is HGPRT, okay, your hyposanthine, okay, guanine, PRT. So two enzymes in purine metabolism. Number one on the list is xanthine oxidase. Number two is HGPRT. Now, question, what do we call the disease which has a deficiency of HGPRTase? It presents with mental retardation. It also presents with aggressive behavior, okay? And it presents with self-mutilation. Anyone? Okay, very good. This is known as Lesch Nyhan syndrome. Lesch Nyhan syndrome. So please remember that by heart. Okay. Lesh Nyhan syndrome. Now, memorize this by heart that the enzyme, okay, xanthine oxidase catalyzes the final conversion to uric acid. So hyposanthine becomes xanthine, xanthine becomes uric acid. So that is the direction. Hyposanthine is converted to xanthine. Xanthine is further converted to uric acid. 
what is the common enzyme in these two reactions? The common enzyme in these two reactions is xanthine oxidase. Now, question, what is the name of the drug which inhibits xanthine oxidase? This is used for the treatment of chronic gout. Okay, it is allo purinol. Okay. Allopurinol is used for the treatment of chronic gout. Why? What is the drug of choice for an acute gouty attack? Any drug of choice for an acute gouty attack? What is the drug of choice? Okay, it is now colchicine. Okay, the drug of choice for an acute gouty attack is colchicine. Chronic gout is allopurinol. So don't forget the action of colchicine on the microtubules. Okay, it's a mitotic spindle, my uh, microtubule inhibitor. It's anti-inflammatory. So please take note of that. That's a sure ball in your exam. So here is allopurinol. It is a hyposanthine analog that inhibits xanthine oxidase. A hyposanthine analog that inhibits xanthine oxidase. And don't forget, there's another drug which inhibits xanthine oxidase, and this is feboxustat. Okay. Common brands would be furic or furicase. Now, one advantage of fuboxistat is it has lesser hypersensitivity or allergic reactions, particularly Steven Johnson syndrome, which is common in with allopurinol. And this is the disease. Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. This is the X-linked disease, which is associated with the absence of HGPRTase, Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. Now, if we dig deeper into Harper's clinical biochemistry, there is a disease of purine and pyrimidine metabolism, which we call orotic aciduria. Okay, this is a rare hereditary disease, which is characterized by elevated levels of orotic acid in the urine. Okay, orotic aciduria. Now, I want you to remember that orotic aciduria, let me take note, let me just call this OA. Okay, orotic aciduria is associated with mental retardation, it's associated with megaloblastic anemia, okay, mental retardation, megaloblastic anemia, and immunodeficiency. Okay, and of course, the high levels of erotic acid in the urine. So this is usually a result of the absence of these two enzymes, uh, orotate phosphoribosyl transferase, or orotate monophosphate decarboxylase. So please take note of that. So there's going to be excess or high levels of erotic acid in the urine. So if this was a baby, then you might want to include poor suck. Okay, poor suck. It's hereditary erotic aciduria. So please take note of this. Now here, 
another very important uh, biochemical, biochemical reaction, which I think is a must know for every student preparing for a biochem exam. And this is the inhibition of TMP synthesis. Okay, that's thymine, thymidine, monophosphate synthesis. Now, all eyes here, we have dump or deoxyuridine monophosphate being converted to TMP. That's the thymidine monophosphate. So I want everyone to put this in their heads that it is actually going to be dump. Okay. It's actually going to be dump being converted. Okay, so dump being converted to TMP. So say this to yourself right now, dump to TMP. Okay, and what is that famous enzyme that catalyzes this reaction? This is the famous thymidylate synthase. Now, question, what is the very important antineoplastic drug that inhibits thymidylate synthase? Okay, it is 5-FU or 5-fluorouracil. Memorize that 5-FU inhibits thymidylate synthase. So anti-cancer therapy. Okay, so please take note of that. Now, since our goal is to top your exam, there is another uh, TMP or thy thymidylate synthase inhibitor, which is used for colorectal ca carcinoma. And what is used, of course, is 5-FU. This is RALT, okay, take note of the spelling, RALT Trexed, okay. I want you to jot that down. This is a, a more modern okay, drug, which is also a TMP synthase inhibitor. That is raltitrexed. Now question, what enzyme, we know this is gonna come out, what enzyme does the chemo drug methotrexate inhibit? Methotrexate inhibits what enzyme? Okay, methotrexate inhibits dihydrofolate reductase. Okay, do not take the exams if you do not know that methotrexate inhibits dihydrofolate reductase, while 5 fluorouracil inhibits 5 fluorouracil and raltitrexid inhibits thymidylate synthase. So please memorize that. So you don't have to memorize everything in your handouts, everything in your textbooks. You just have to be familiar and memorize the right things, okay? Now next, my famous friends, Watson and Crick. Now, the photo that you see here is actually the original Watson and Crick model for DNA. So what is this Watson and Crick model? It states that DNA is double-stranded. So here's strand number one. Here's strand number two. It is helical, as you can see in the photo. It's anti-parallel, and it is right handed, which means it's the right strand that turns first. If you make an imaginary axis here, let me drop a line here. If you make an imaginary axis, the two strands of DNA will form a helix as it makes a complete turn. Now, I want everyone to memorize that one complete turn, okay, one complete turn of Watson and Crick model is 34 
Armstrong. Okay. So if this is the five prime, trace it. Okay, here it is. So it's now anti-parallel. The other strand is three prime. Trace it. Here's the three prime on the anti-parallel side. So whenever you hear human DNA, always remember we are referring to, okay, we are referring to the Watson and Crick model. Okay, we are referring to the Watson and Crick model. So please take note of this. So Watson and Crick model. Now, in addition to the must knows, let's talk about the genetic code in RNA. Now, this is the famous central dogma, which I mentioned earlier. Now, in the central dogma, everything begins with DNA replication. DNA will then undergo transcription. So DNA undergoes replication. DNA is transcribed to become RNA. And the RNA is translated to a protein. So again, According to the central dogma, what is the flow? This is a central dogma of molecular biology. What is the flow of genetic information? It begins with replication, so in particular order, then transcription, and lastly, translation. Memorize that by heart. So that is the sequence of the central dogma. Now, there is a process where an RNA is now transcribed to DNA. This is what we refer to as reverse transcription. Now, what is that infamous virus which exhibits reverse transcription? Okay. That is human immunodeficiency virus or HIV. That is why part of the drugs and the regimen treatment for HIV are the reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So the enzyme which catalyzes the transcription of RNA to DNA is known as reverse transcriptase. Okay, it is known as reverse transcriptase. Okay, now this is the sequence of the major processes again, replication, transcription, and translation. Okay, now let me introduce you to the famous replication fork. Now in the replication fork, I want everyone to pay attention that there's a leading strand and there is a lagging strand. So this leading strand is the five prime going to the three prime. The lagging strand is the three prime going to the five. So leading is five to three. Lagging is three to five direction. 
Now we have a very important enzyme here, which is helicase. And I want everyone to remember by heart that this enzyme helicase is responsible for unwinding of DNA. So here's the DNA. There is unwinding. Okay. Then we have the famous Okazaki fragments, which is what uh, connects the leading and the lagging strand. So what joins the Okazaki fragments is the famous enzyme DNA ligase. So again, what does DNA ligase do? This is responsible for joining the Okazaki fragments. So please take note of these pearls about replication. So take note, the unwinding of the DNA, this is helicase. The formation of the swivels, this is DNA topoisomerase. So let's go back here. This is the DNA polymerase. The swivel is what you see here as there's unwinding of DNA. So the swivel is again because of DNA topoisomerase. Now question, what is the famous, okay? What is the famous uh, antibiotic that inhibits DNA topoisomerase? What is the famous antibiotics which would inhibit DNA topoisomerase or what we call DNA gyrase? Okay, this, this is the famous quinolones. Uh, classic prototype of quinolones is nalidixic acid. Then we also have, of course, the ciprofloxacin. Okay, now, don't forget topoisomerase or DNA gyrase is inhibited by quinolones. Don't forget the prototype, nalidixic acid, and you have a fluorinated generation, which is now ciprofloxacin. So here, in the replication, we have the Okazaki fragments, so the leading and the lagging strands. So let me show you this. So these are your Okazaki fragments. Leading is five prime, lagging is three prime. So if this was a game and your score is five, you're leading. If this was a game, your score is three, you're lagging behind, okay? So this is DNA ligase again, okay? It joins the Okazaki fragments. It also seals the DNA mix. joins the Okazaki fragments or it seals the DNA mix. Now, something I anticipate is a question on the different types of RNA. We have three major types, the mRNA, the tRNA, and the rRNA. mRNA stands for messenger RNA, T stands for transfer RNA, and R stands for ribosomal RNA. Now, question. Which of these three RNAs is considered to be the template? Which is considered to be the template? Okay, the template is the mRNA. Okay, the template is the mRNA. So please take note of this. mRNA is the template. Now, 
what are the characteristics of the messenger RNA? It has a five prime cap. It has a three prime tail. If you notice here, I showed you an icon of a postman or a mailman because the mailman carries the message, okay? Like messenger RNA. He's wearing a cap and he has a tail, okay? So he's wearing a cap. Now next is the transfer RNA. The transfer RNA is letter T. It's tiny. It is the smallest, okay, of the RNAs. It has the famous clover leaf appearance. Okay, so here, this is basically how transfer RNA would look like. We have the clover leaf appearance. Okay, the clover leaf appearance. Now the rRNA serves as a molecular scaffold, so support. 65% is RNA, 35% is ribosomes. Now we have three subunits here, the 70S, the 50S, and the 30S. Now, what are the two antibiotics that would inhibit the 30S subunit? Can you give me antibiotics which would inhibit the 30S subunit? What are the names of the antibiotics? So we have amino glycosides and there is tetracyclines, okay, amino glycosides and tetracyclines. So please take note of this. amino glycosides and tetracyclines. Now here, with regards to the transcription of RNA, so some properties I want you to know. Number one, only one DNA strand is transcribed. It proceeds in one direction, which is five prime to three prime. There are three steps in RNA transcription, initiation, elongation, and termination. Initiation, elongation, and termination. Now the area where transcription starts, this is known as the promoter region. This is known as the promoter region. Please take note of this, okay, the promoter region. So these are the key must knows regarding RNA transcription. Now, tip, what about translation? So translation is where protein synthesis occurs. Now, translation would now involve the three RNAs, mRNA, tRNA, and the ribosomal RNA. Now, translation is characterized with the presence of the initiation and the start codons. Now, I want everyone to remember the initiation codon is AUG. Now, don't forget a codon is comprised of three bases. So in layman's terms, that's three letters, okay? So the initiation or start codon is AUG. Once upon a time, the Philippine board exams was in August, 
That's why I would remind students they are initiated in August. Now it's in October. Now, if there are initiation and start codons, there's also the termination and the stop codons. Okay. Now, what are the three stop codons? Okay. What are the three stop codons? We have UAG, UAA, we have UGA. Now, if there is a mutation that involves the termination or stop codons. This is what we call a nonsense mutation. Okay, there is a premature termination, nonsense mutation. So I love to remind students just remember this statement stop talking nonsense. Okay, so the stop codon is a nonsense mutation. Now, what specific mutation is a substitution of valine and glutamic acid okay, at position six of the beta globin chain? What type of mutation is this? This is a classic example of a missense or a point mutation. So this is sickle cell anemia. Okay, this is classic sickle cell anemia. That's a Smith sense or a point mutation. Now, this is lifted from your biochemistry textbook. These are the drugs that inhibits translation. We have streptomycin, tetracycline, erythromycin, puromycin, and chloramphenicol. Now let's play around with your memory banks. Streptomycin, this is used second line for anti-tuberculosis. This is a macrolide. Therefore, what are the two side effects which you have to remember about macrolides? I know about aminoglycosides. I stand corrected. Streptomycin is an aminoglycoside. So there is nephrotoxicity and there is autotoxicity. Okay. Nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity. Now, what about tetracycline? Tetracycline uh, is not supposed to be given with antacids. What happens if tetracycline is given with antacids? So chelation occurs and there is now milk alkali syndrome. Now chronic tetracycline use leads to teeth discoloration. So don't forget tetracycline is teeth discoloration. Erythromycin being a macrolide causes nausea and vomiting and direct stimulation of the gut. Chloramphenicol, on the other hand, particularly in a preterm baby, if there is a lack of the enzyme glucoronyl transferase, okay, what, would, what disease would you encounter? Okay, you have an ashen gray color of the skin. Okay, this is now what we call gray baby syndrome. You cannot separate pharmacology and biochemistry. So please take note of this, okay? Now, some properties of the genetic code. Number one, it's universal. Number two, it's contiguous. Next, it is degenerate, and it is unambiguous or specific.
universal, contiguous, degenerate, and unambiguous. Okay, so please take note of this. These are the properties of the genetic code. Universal, contiguous, degenerate, and unambiguous. Now, this is one property I would like to highlight, okay? And this is the concept of degeneracy, okay? The genetic code is redundant because a single amino acid may be coded for by more than one codon. Degenerate. Degeneracy. Okay, that means the genetic code is redundant because a single amino acid may be coded for by more than one codon. So, as to your stop codons, okay, don't forget this UGA, UAA, UAG. Okay, the famous mnemonics. You are annoying, you go away, you are gone. You are annoying, you go away, you are gone. Okay, now, does anyone know where the initiation codon is found? The initiation codon is found in what sequence in eukaryotes? The initiation codon is found in the initiation codon is found where? Okay, where is it found? It is found in what sequence? This is what we call the Kozak sequence. So the initiation codon, which is AUG, is found in the COSAC sequence. And what uh, amino acid is found in the initiation codon? What very important amino acid? Okay, it is methionine. Okay, methionine. Now, what anchors, okay, what sequence anchors the prokaryotic messenger RNA to the 16S subunit of the rRNA during translation. This is the famous shine dalgarno sequence. Okay, what anchors the prokaryotic messenger RNA to the 16S rRNA of the ribosome? during translation. This is the shine Algarno sequence. So please remember this. Now, I want you to be familiar with the uncoupling protein, okay, which is found in the mitochondria of brown adipose tissue. Would anyone happen to know what is the name of this uncoupling protein? This is known as thermogenin. Okay, this is known as thermogenin. Now for the blot techniques, which is the blot technique which utilizes DNA? 
which is the block technique which utilizes DNA. So DNA is Southern block. I like to remind students south, south, down south, okay? Northern block utilizes RNA and the famous Western block, which is the confirmatory test for HIV, utilizes protein. So southern blot is DNA, northern blot is RNA, western blot is protein. And what is the famous enzyme that we use for PCR? Polymerase chain reaction or the gene amplification. So we utilize the heat stable enzyme, which is known as TAC polymerase, okay? This is for PCR, TAC polymerase. So this played a very, very important role, most especially with our COVID PCR tests, TAC polymerase. And what do we call a small piece of DNA that inserts itself into another place in the genome? These are known as jumping genes or transposons. So if there is a mutation which involves a jumping gene, this is what we call insertional mutagenesis. Okay, this is what we call insertional mutagenesis. Please take note of that. Okay, this is the jumping genes. These are also known as transposons. Now, don't forget the difference between an exon and an intron. So the exons are the actual genetic information coding for the protein. So I like to remind students, the exons are the ones that are expressed. The introns are letter I. They are the intervening non-coding segments of DNA. So we have exons, then we have the introns. The exons are expressed while the introns are not expressed. The introns are the intervening non-coding segments of DNA. Okay. Now, lastly, we have the famous, okay, set of structural genes coding for a group of proteins for a particular metabolic function. What do we call the set of structural genes coding for a group of proteins for a particular metabolic function? This is the famous lactose operon or the lac operon. This is, of course, the lactose operon uh, of E. coli, which is the prototype. And lastly, the smallest gene for DNA expression. Can anyone tell me what is the smallest gene for DNA expression. This is what we call a cistron. Okay, this is what we call a cistron. Got it? Okay. So this would end our genetics coaching. I hope you learned something.